So let's get into some of these conspiracies, man. Um, the first one, how you feel about people that say Suge Knight has something to do with Tupac Doof? Uh, Business-wise, the most stupidest move you can probably ever think of. It destroyed a company that was worth more than Tupac's music. Two, you didn't know if Tupac's music was going to take off like that after death. You, nobody knew that shit. Who took off after death like that? Before then, a rapper. You can't name one. After death, okay, you know what? I'm going to kill this dude and his shit's going to skyrocket. You know what I'm saying? So, it don't add up business-wise. And the way I seen Suge the night of the shooting, he was seriously not there. Like, like it really shook him. You know what I'm saying? Like he wasn't himself. Right. And he was never himself the time that I was there in Vegas. He only had to become himself for media. Like he couldn't be like, you know, sad. That's just not what he was trying to pres He bought into his own image. You know what I'm saying? Maybe he'd been more remorseful in the situation, but he wasn't portrayed that way. Uh, the Cabo trip, Pac on Pac. Pac and Sugar got into a bet on, um, Sugar had his, um, his yacht. Uh, I can't remember the name. It was some pyro or something. But, and, uh, they might've been like 200 yards from sand. And Pac made a bet that I can outswim Sugar. You know what I'm saying? I can outswim So they jump in the ocean. Pac gets halfway. <laughs> Starts to drown. Actually drown. You know what I'm saying? Should brings this nigga to the land. Pac is unresponsive. They had to like, you know, resuscitate this dude. Like, like he could have died. He could have drowned. Pac saves his life. Out of that, out of that situation, um, the song You Never Had a Friend Like Me comes out. Comes from that situation. So that was the story behind that song? Yeah. Okay, okay. Your friend's my enemy. You ain't never had a friend like me. That came after the fact of that song. I mean, after that incident. And see, a lot of people don't know that. Like, when they talk about the old Suge um, kill Pop, I could have let the niggas around. You know what I'm saying? Nah. You don't, you know, stop somebody from drowning and then they say, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to have you shot, like, uh, a few months later. It don't make sense. See, a lot of people don't know that. You know what I'm saying? Lisa Ray, she was in Cabo, right? Yeah, that was my first time um, meeting Lisa Ray and finding out that, that, that her and the brat were sisters. I remember that. Tell me about that. Um, she was just cool was because you got to understand, like, the circle that I ran with at Death Row, we were all from the Midwest. It was either, like, I heard them back from St. Louis, then from Chicago. I'm from this area. You know what I'm saying? And Lisa Ray was from Chicago. So that was a, the connection that we all had. So she gravitated toward us. Um, that's when, like I said, when I found out they were her, the brat was her sister. So what's that before Lisa Ray did the um, Toss It Up video or after? After. It was right after. Okay, so she was hanging around Death Row after she did that Toss It Up video for It was right after. That's why she was invited. Oh, okay. They had shot that video, and then we went to Cabo. How you feel about Biggie coming to L.A. six months after Tupac passed away? Wrong move. Wrong move. I had a lot of love for Biggie because before I got with Death Row, you know, um, 95... Early during the year, 95, right here in Chicago, I met Biggie and Puffy um, on uh, the tour, uh, a promotional tour for the, f uh, the first album. Ready yeah, to Ready to Die. Yeah, I met them. And I might have met him again in L.A. And he remembered me. And it was, he, was, he was always cool. So I really never had a, 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 a problem with them. Um, my bad boy thing was competition. You the competition. 
You know what I'm saying? We this team, y'all that team. We going at y'all, y'all going at us. Let's see who win on the music. You know what I'm saying? Um, I remember the, the, the morning I woke up and listened to the radio and in LA and I, was, and I heard that actually somebody called me and they said, you know, Biggie got killed. And I'm like, what? And I said, hold on, let me call you back. So I turned on the radio and they were saying, Biggie got killed last night. And I'm like, God damn, we did it. <laughs> That's my first thought. Damn, we did it. You know what I'm saying? Why? We did it. Why the fuck was he here? That had to be us. You know what I'm saying? Because it just it just didn't make sense. Why would you be here? Yeah, man. So was you in L.A. at that time when Biggie was down here? Was you still in L.A.? So how did you feel about him coming out here promoting, you know, Life Like the Delph and him being on the radio stations, freestyling and long kiss goodnight? He didn't and... understand the dynamics of what was going on out here, out there. You know what I'm saying? He didn't understand that shit. I understood it. I've been dealing with it before I got with Death Row. I was already dealing with, with street shit and bloods and shit and I understood the gang activity out there. So I knew that, you know, man, I could tell you, man, <laughs> I remember trying to come up in the industry and it was like people that wanted to deal with me that was gang affiliated and they was like, man, you know what? Okay, what we gonna do is we gonna go kidnap such and such from such and such records, you know what I'm saying? And then we gonna make them sign paperwork and sign you as a producer. I'm your manager and everything, you know what I'm saying? So I knew like these dudes will go at it to get that money. So you you coming out to this kind of situation, you can get killed for $125. You know what I'm saying? A hit, like I give you $125, you go shoot this dude. It's that simple out there at that time. You know what I'm saying? I would have never, and have a record talking about I'm going back to Cali. And then you had other records that were questionable. Like you getting that pop. Uh -uh. Wrong move. Too soon. The beef between Tupac and Johnny J. Tell me about that. That was a weird one because me and Johnny J were, were cool. You know what I'm saying? Johnny J's wife had, she does all his business. So I was actually supposed to have a, a, a MOB that I produced was actually supposed to be on All Eyes On Me because All Eyes On Me was 28 songs, 14 on book one, 14 on book two. And she told me the mix day, I need to get that song mixed. And somehow somebody hated on me and they, they knocked my mix date off so that I would miss the album. So it's 27 songs on there, 14 on one, side 13 on the other mob was missing mob was missing for like 10 years before it came out on um until the end of time album but um they were like this and even in cabo we was together i was actually staying with johnny j we had a big um a big mansion that we were staying in in cabo we all had different mansions and johnny j was in our mansion so so he was a part of the camp then. This was, we looking at what, February, March, somewhere around there. And um, then next you know, like he was out of there. He was, he disappeared. And I was like, well, where's Johnny? He's like, why is Johnny J around no more? And they were like, it was over money. He wanted his money. And Death Row was saying like, you know, everything Johnny, Day, Johnny J did was a sample. And with samples, you have to clear those motherfuckers with whoever you, you sample every fucking thing he did on all eyes on me was a sample of somebody else's music. So if he didn't clear those samples, that meant death row had to clear those samples and some of, and they, they already put the album out. So with samples, if you, if you put the album out and the album is selling millions, the person who owned the sample can be like, I want a million dollars for my little piece that you just use. You got to pay them. So somewhere along the line, it became a problem with death row. And, and 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 Johnny J and I don't know how the fuck that got it, how Pop got in the mix of that, but he was out the door. And they were like this before Death Row, you know what I'm saying? So it was multiple people like that that I know that was like this with Pop before Death Row, and then months after it was like, 
And I ran into him and I was like, what's up with you? And my dude didn't change on me, man. Did you see Tupac make any comments about Jenny J? None. He never spoke on that situation with Johnny J. What about anybody else on Death Row? Nope. Other than maybe the outlaws talking about the situation, what it might have been, it was behind money. What did they say exactly? Basically, it was behind money. You know what I'm saying? But later on, I found out about the publishing, like, you know what I'm saying? How did, you know, I knew how publishing worked and with samples. If you sample, you got to clear those samples. If you don't clear those samples, they're going to come after you when the album is already out and then they're going to want more. And if you don't give them that more, they can shut your album down. They can be like, man, take that shit off the shelf till I get paid. So you got to give them that money. And, and maybe that was, you know, the end results of what that was about. Mob James. Did you see Mob James around Death Row? Uh, I never seen Mob James around the studio, but I heard his name. And the, 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 the main story I have about hearing his name was I remember uh, we was at the studio one night uh, everybody had left, Sugar and them had left, and it was like a few of us still at the studio working, and then somebody said, Mob James is on the way to the studio, and motherfuckers started cutting off the lights, equipment turning off, I don't give a fuck what you was recording, the engineers was like, tch, tch, over, <coughs> situation over, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? They said, Mob James is on the way, I'm like, who the fuck is Mob James? They said, the only motherfucker Sugar ain't scared of. I'm like, that god damn, this motherfucker must be somebody, like, powerful, you know what I'm saying? That's the first time I heard Mob James. 